Hello everyone and welcome to another Tonk Mass Transmissions Live. Excited to be with you the week before Mini Stravaganza 2.0. We'll call it that. Uh, begins. That's going to be next week, September 9th through the 11th. So if you haven't heard about it yet, we're going to be getting together as a studio, doing three days of awesome streaming content. We're going to be playing games. We're going to be doing hobby streams. We're going to be having dev panels and art panels and all kinds of stuff. I believe that the schedule is going to be going up soon-ish. BK's in the chat. He might have an exact date for you. I know that we just reviewed the final schedule today and it seemed good. Uh, so I would expect that in the next day or so. And of course, we've announced some things like for Marvel Crisis Protocol players, we have our next global campaign where you can play at home or in your game stores or wherever it's safe to play for you. Uh, we're going to be seeing if the Empirical can wipe out all magic from the Earth or if Doctor Strange can rally the mystical defenders of uh, the planet and fight off their invasion from one of my favorite Doctor Strange storylines that they ever did right before he blasted off into space uh, and gave us our new version of Doctor Strange that we showed off last week uh, in the panel of play. So with that, uh, let's look forward to one of the characters that you can see a panel on next week. In fact, I think it's the very first panel uh, on Thursday that's going to happen right after opening ceremonies. We're going to be painting up the Hulkbuster, which we started last week. We got really far on him. I did a little bit of cleanup work and a bit more um, prep work just to kind of like take what we were doing last week and get it to a conclusion place where we can dive in and uh, hopefully wrap this bad boy up. Maybe start work on the little Hulkbuster Iron Man that comes with him. Uh, but with that said, let's get this camera off of me and on to the star of our show, which is this big old boy right here. So you can see here how we have that really nice black metallic, and we did all that using a silver undercoat and then just went through with several layers of black glaze and just slowly tinted the surface of the miniature, uh, which gives us this really cool kind of like car finish where you have that really nice black gloss. Uh, it's a very fun and cool technique, especially for armor. You can do this with literally any color, uh, and of course, you know, everything is, is very simple. Um, as long as you have the patience to do it, get a hair dryer and just start blow drying everything in. The other thing that I did is I went through and I did all of our gold areas. Again, we're basing this kind of off of the Stealth Suit Marvel Now uh, Iron Man colors when he was in the black and the gold with the red glow. So we're going to be doing some red glow today on this, this little fella as well. Uh, but I used Viking Gold, finished off all of those sections from scale. And then I simply went through and uh, I did a quick wash using brown ink, a little bit of chestnut ink, and some glaze medium. I didn't figure like we really needed to see that part. We've done a lot of washing on the channel before, um, and there's a lot here to it. And I wanted to be able to dive right in and just start painting um, right away. So the things that we're going to do today, are we're going to finish off the gold. We're going to do some highlighting on the gold. We'll add the glow. Uh, we might go through and add just a little bit of edge highlighting silver on the black plates. And then... Once we're done with that, we'll dive in and we'll jump into uh, Iron Man parentheticals Hulkbuster. So the little Iron Man that comes with the Hulkbuster. And if you want to know how exactly he works with Hulkbuster in the game, again, you should check out that first panel at Mini Stravaganza next week. We're going to be doing a live panel to play for Hulkbuster where we go over the rules, kind of the dev, all of that good stuff that went along with it. So... All right, so let's go ahead and... Oh yeah, this technique would work for any color. Like you can do green, you can do blue, red, you probably do yellow. Um, it all just matters about your undertone, your base. So for like blue, I would use silver. For red, you should probably use a gold instead of a silver like we did because the red won't turn pink as you glaze it over and all of that stuff. So um, everything's good to go. Question if... Ending up with everything I paint being really dark, even over a white primer. Uh, I mean, if you're painting over a really light primer, it shouldn't wind up getting... I mean, you shouldn't really have a problem with uh, it being super dark. My question would be, are you, like, using a wash? Uh, if you're washing everything, that's going to dilute the color down. It's going to distill the color and make it darker, because that's what washes do. So you do, after you do a wash, you need to go back through with your base coat and then do some rec reclamation, like reclaim the areas where you don't want the darkness of the wash to be, and then do some highlighting. I'm going to go in, speaking of highlighting, use this dwarven gold here on top of our viking gold for a little bit of gold highlighting. All right, so I'm going to grab my secondary brush then here. 
yeah, this would work really great. Um, this would work really great for Ghost Rider's bike as well. Anything you wanted to be like a metallic, a black metallic, or any kind of colored metallic, if you wanted to paint your um, your cars from the core set as well in kind of a more traditional car color rather than like a comic book style. Flip over my brush so it's actually right. I'm just gonna blend that out a little bit. Maintain some of the darkness. I really like the, the dull dark that we get from that brown wash. So I just kinda wanna go through and kinda looking at the edges. Um, but the overall this glazing technique actually used it in one of the very first streams we did when we were just starting. I did a green Hydra inspired Iron Man using a silver wash and then using some green Vallejo green wash um, or green ink and just running it right over the top. So you can definitely adapt this to whatever kind of like look you want. You can always play with it. Uh, you can make it more stark, obviously doing a little bit of edge highlighting will really help push that metal effect if you want it to be brighter. But it really just comes down to, to do it successfully, uh, patience. You know, doing that glaze coat three, four times. If you have an airbrush, uh, you can just airbrush the ink straight through it on top of the silver and that works really well and actually will speed up the process but you know not everybody has one of those in their arsenal and i don't blame you it's an expensive and kind of very specialized tool so it requires a specific space setup and maintenance and all that stuff that's why i always like to whenever possible show how to do cool techniques that don't require an airbrush so if you don't have one you don't have to worry about it and if you do have one you can just do the technique a little easier but everything and i make a mistake and then i wipe it off everything is definitely achievable sans airbrush uh i everybody's talking about the new spider-man trailer that was super cool Many people are actually going to go see, uh, or are going to have the opportunity to check out the next Marvel release, Shang, Shang-Chi. I'm excited to check that out too. It should be very fun. Be the first time I've been back to a theater in forever. Actually, when the first Avengers came out, it's crazy to think about, but... When the first Avengers movie came out, my, my first son had just been, like, born not too long ago, so <laughs> we were definitely not going to the theaters at the time, and I didn't see that movie until it came out on, on disc, because I never had the opportunity to go to a theater, and so I was really far behind on that, on seeing that great, that great film, Fatherhood. Makes everything nuts. We're past that now, though. Now I just take them with. Or at least we used to. Kind of looking forward to being able to get back to that maybe at some point. And of course, still enjoying the What If series as well. People watching that. It's been really fun. When are we going to slow down? I mean, who knows? There's so many characters to get to, though. Although, if you want to know more about the future and where we're going, again, I'll just bring everything back to Mini Stravaganza because it's going to be an amazing time, and I hope everybody, you know, if you can join us live, please do. We're going to have so much cool content to show off and talk about but if you can't everything will get posted up on youtube and of course be stored on the twitch archive and all that so whether you're able to do it live or 
joining us a little later, watching it on film. There'll be, hopefully, some pretty exciting developments and things to look forward to. Like I said, the biggest one, uh, you know, plan, plan some of your game time and get ready to play in some cool MCP Global Campaign stuff. If you've ever played in any of the ones we've done previously, the Civil War one, the Infinity War one, now we have this Magic one, you know that they're always a blast. Our new Dev Sarah worked on the, I was like, all right, this is the theme that I want to see for this campaign. What do you got? And she took everything, ran with it, and man, I am super excited. Like, I read the initial draft in Docs, and I was sold. I was like, this is so cool. I can't wait to play myself. So I'm looking forward to running some of the rules, using some of the things. I, of course, will be not defending magic. I will be going full technology, hence my Hulkbuster here. Tony Stark doesn't believe in magic. Why should I? Get rid of it. Sorry, Doctor Strange. I'm going to put you out of a job. All right, so... We will just keep going this way. So again, I'm just doing some simple edge highlighting just to like help add some shine back to the dullness that the wash caused. So I'm just looking for those areas where that light would really bounce and play. And you can be a little, you could do dry brushing with this and that'd be really effective and quick. You just have to be careful not to get any of your dry brush on your blacks. certainly a great way to kind of approach this as well clean that off come in here get this stuff up just a little bit of patience and practice going on nothing super flashy this is just where you put in the work um, this is kind of that point where I'll get really quiet and zen out. Doing highlights is always fun because you just kind of get lost in it. But I don't know how much, it, how exciting it would be to just sit there and watch me paint in silence. So I'll keep chatting, trying to check the chat if anybody's got questions that they want answered or things they're interested in knowing about that I can answer because obviously I got a BK watching me I can't answer everything no mistakes were made erase the mistake that's why you always keep that secondary damp brush right close to hand I keep it just like Dallas taught me clenched between my teeth so if I sound like I'm talking through something, it's because I am. Because without it, mistakes like that would be a lot harder to fix. Ex-Guardian Murder World. That is a big split, as Guardian or Murder World train. I hope you don't mean both at the same time, because I don't think that would work. Yeah, there's definitely, uh, we've got some cool train stuff coming. I think if you're really eagle-eyed, you'll catch some of it uh, during Mini Stravaganza. I know a couple folks spied some not-so-sneaky, uh, at least one not-so-sneaky sign of some of the future train stuff to come in the Dormammu Ultimate Encounter we played. What was that, two weeks ago? So... We always like, I mean, if you pay attention, um, you can certainly spy some things that are typically projects that are on the horizon. So we like to, we like to sneak things in now and again, especially when it comes to terrain. We don't, 
we typically don't do a lot of like pure custom stuff without the intention of maybe looking at someday making it into a product if we think it would be a cool addition to the game because train is so important to the experience and obviously setting the stage for the marvel world and stuff is very cool spider-man and doc ock i can tell you some stuff for sure um so the rivals panels rival panel spider-man doc ock that actually came it's one of my favorite products and i'm so i'm super thrilled that it's finally announced because we've been it's a it's a true labor of love we it started with a simple conversation dallas and i were talking about you know if we could re-sculpt spider-man and dr octopus we were just talking about characters in general but if we could re-sculpt some characters, like which ones would we definitely want to do? Like what could we what could we do now having learned a lot of lessons and you know improved our skills and everything? Like what could we do? And we started talking um, a bit about different characters, and of course the first two that came up were or that quickly dominated the conversation were Spider-Man and Doctor Octopus, and what could we do? How would we make them different? Like, what are the crazy things that would be available now in hard plastic that we didn't think we could even do at the time? And, uh... <laughs> and, uh... <coughs> excuse me. I'm getting choked up. Um, so, we kind of had our discussions, and we talked about some posing and things, and what we could do, and we talked with Marco, and the idea kind of started to take on a little bit of a life of its own. And we're like, hey, why not? Why don't we just, why don't we just see, why don't we just do some re-sculpts? Or like start to think about this. Let's do some, some designs and everything. And just kind of like see what we can come up with. And we thought it'd be a good way to kind of test the waters at getting the core set. Some of the core set characters that were really popular in terms of like, you know, just the characters themselves out there. And we had some space on the schedule to kind of play and explore. And that's how you always get better, right? It's always, it's never doing the same thing that you've done 500 times before. It's when you take a chance. And since we didn't have to worry about well, what happens if this doesn't work the way we want, or maybe this just becomes something that doesn't work down the line, we had the time to explore it. And so we decided to just kind of like make it a little personal pet project and go forward and see what we could do. And of course, as these things do, so I was sitting there and I was like thinking about it from what would be cool, what would I want to see as, you know, a fan of these characters and a lifelong Spider-Man fan. And okay, so we have cool, we have cool poses, but what can we do next? And I came up with this idea and I ran over, we were still working in the office at the time together. And I walked over to Dawson. I was like, what if we did the poses in such a way that they like made this really cool battle scene? And then we gave you a little like scenic diorama backdrop, you know, like a little piece of like brick wall terrain or something. So they're like fighting in a warehouse, but it kind of sets the stage. So you can just, you can just set them up and they look really cool on the shelf and they tell this little story. And now we have this kind of like cohesive, fun, artsy boutique kind of product thing that also updates these cool characters in a new way. And um, as Dallas is wont to do, he was like, that's ah, so awesome. I love it. And then I, he's like, let me draw it. And all of a sudden, my my work chat starts blowing up a couple hours later of these different iterations of things that he had drawn. <laughs> and and it starts to like, here's the brick wall. <clears throat> it's kind of neat. You know, like, I think this could work. And then it was like, but what if there was like a crane and what if there was this? And then all of a sudden we went from like a simple kind of like factory brick wall, here it is, to this to this really crazy, now we're on this uh, broken skyscraper, this under construction skyscraper, which we've seen that scene like a hundred times before, right? It's so iconic. We get them up in the air, we kind of fake the height. Um, we use a bunch of different like optical illusion tricks to make it feel like they're on level you know, level 60 of a skyscraper, level 63 came later. That was an Evan touch and a genius one at that. Um, for if, if you don't know yet or haven't figured it out, that is the first appearance 
of one Dr. Octopus, 1963. Um, but anyway, so all of a sudden, you know, like it goes from, we'll just do this cute little back wall scenic drop to now we have this, this amazing, like, can we do it skyscraper idea? We have these poses that are just completely over the top. Doc Ock is way up on his tentacles. He's going to be shooting a laser blast at Parker, who's dodging it, and there's an explosion behind Parker. Like, this whole thing. It was amazing. We were so excited. And we are like, okay, well, let's let's do it. Let's see what we can do. Let's try to make this. And it was, at the time, one of the most ambitious kind of artistic miniature products that we were working on and, and projects. And uh, it, it was incredible. It was so fun to kind of let ourselves explore the art of tabletop miniatures, you know, being lifelong hobbyists. And uh, I, I wake up every morning and instead of like going to the gym, I spend 60 to 90 minutes every morning painting. That's just, that's my time. So getting to kind of push and explore what we can do with these amazing characters and the stories that they tell and all of that stuff uh, and just improve as like creators of miniatures and products. I mean, that's what we set out to do in the first place. We said at Gen Con, one of our mission statements was we wanted to strive to become one of the best creators of hobby tabletop miniatures in the world and the games that support them. And this was such a big, it was a big step and I was just a blast to work on the whole time. And you know, at the end, it is it is very much part of our passion for the hobby and our love of this artistic medium. Not only the games around them, but also just, you know, painting and displaying and working on all this stuff. And I think that made this product really unique because we were able to say, okay, well, it isn't for everyone. And I would never claim that every product is for everyone. You know, if you just want, if you're more interested in the game rules and, you know, you love how the miniatures support the game rules and make play really smooth and fun, then this this might not be for you. You know, if you're a huge Spider-Man fan or a Doc Ock fan, like, this shows those characters in a way that is just incredible. Um, and so fun. So, <clears throat> maybe that is. And then if you're a hobbyist, you know, and you love painting or you want, you've always wanted to paint like a really cool diorama, didn't know where to start, how to build it, anything like that. Like this thing is tailor made to just look amazing on the shelf as it's displayed. The characters just take these beloved icons to whole new heights. It really does show, it's such a great culmination of the last, you know, almost four years we've been working on forever. So... <clears throat> Um, yeah, it was just, it was one of those things where like, what started as kind of a crazy, like, what if our own internal, what if kind of discussion turned into something that for at every aspect has just been a blast. We, we even challenged the factory to come up with a brand new process for foiling their cards because we wanted foil on both sides of the stat card. So as you'll as you'll see, spoiler alert, the cool holographic foil is both on the injured and the healthy side. And initially we were told that probably wouldn't work because you can't, the process that allows you to foil delaminates the foil on the back side when you run it through the machine. And we were like, well, what can you do about that? And lo and behold, you know, the folks we were working with were quite incredible and they came up with a process that allowed that to work. And I don't know if we're the very first people, but as far as like Asmodee products go, we broke new ground on that too. So that was really fun. And there you go. That's my, that's my spiel on that. So it is, you know, I, I, hopefully it is, uh, an amazing homage to these fantastic characters um, it's kind of our love letter to the hobby. It's a, certainly in, you know, something where we wanted to 
flex our skills and get better and improve. And a lot of the lessons we learned on that have applied, have been applied to things that you will see and have seen and all that stuff. So it was a huge, it was a huge thing for the studio and just what we did and who we are in so many ways. And I couldn't be damn prouder of that whole set. And I have mine sitting next to me and I can't wait to get it on the painting table and start working on it and put this new amazing Spider-Man and Doc Ock sculpts on my shelf and start using them in games and all of that for those core set characters. And I hope, you know, I really do hope that we get to do more of it in the future because, man, do we have so many ideas now. Um, as a lot of people uh, I was very excited to see point out, there's so many cool iconic rivalries and groups that you could do this with. Uh, and I think that it's going to be so fun to hopefully get to explore that and really just expand you know, this little segment of what the game can mean. And I think it's another thing that makes Crisis Protocol so rewarding and fun is that, you know, it's more than just a miniatures game. It's more than just amazing miniatures. It is, you know, in some ways, our particular love love letter to Marvel and the amazing impact and characters that it's had and, you know, a small homage to the fandom that has been with these characters and loves them and the stories around them. So it's let's get let's get sappy. Let's get sappy on a Tuesday. Why not? We're right there. All right. So there we go. We highlighted up all that gold. You can see how now how it's kind of popping. We have really nice kind of reclaim some of that back. Everything ready to go. <laughs> I mean, Spider-Man is a reserve member of the Avengers in some storylines, that's true. But this this is still core set Spider-Man, still young Spider-Man. No new rules, that was another big thing. Um, because this product, this whole project in general was conceived as kind of a big love letter to the hobby miniature side of things. You know, like I said, we didn't want to make anybody feel like they were forced, quote unquote, to have to get it if they just were happy with what they got out of the core set. And I am still very proud of what we did in the core set. And I think, you know, again, you have to look at things that you did in the past with the eye of, did you do the greatest work you could do in the past? And did you learn your lessons? No different than a hobby miniatures fan. That's why Dallas always talks about how he never strips anything. And I'm right there with him. The only time I ever strip a miniature and start again is if I make a huge mistake or I have a pot of paint spill on it or something. But once I call a miniature done and I put it on the shelf, that is my piece of art for the rest of my life. It's not... It's not something that, you know... I'm going to go back to and fix later um, because it's it's my greatest work at the time that I did it or it's my learning experience you know and that's that's part of the joy of the hobby and watching yourself improve and I think to rob yourself of that because everything has to be perfect is some people are worried about you know on the stream like what if I didn't what if I didn't do my best well at the time it absolutely was your best and you should celebrate it for that. Especially if you had fun doing it. If you if you enjoyed the process, even if like the act of doing it was hard, kind of like working out or you know, running running three miles a day. It's not it's not fun typically when you're starting and you're running those three miles. It's it's work. But by the time you're done, you take enjoyment from that, you you appreciate the results, the transformation of everything. It's the same with miniatures painting. You know, I didn't always love blending with a secondary brush. It was hard. I had to think about it. I messed up a lot. It never came out quite as good as I wanted it to. 
now I love it. You know, it's just like, it's so therapeutic because I'm at that point where like, okay, what's the next challenge? Where am I going next? How am I improving? Do I want to improve? Sometimes plateaus are perfectly fine places to live. Never forget that, you know, not everything has to be a struggle of constant improvement. Improve when you want to enjoy the places that you're at. There were years where I was like, I know exactly how I'm going to paint this. I'm going to do this with my metals. I'm going to dry brush them. I'm going to wash them. I'm going to dry brush them one more time. And that's it. Who needs to do anything else to metals? Anyone else who paints metals any other way is a fool because they're doing too much work. And then one day I was like, well, but what if I tried it this way? What if I did, you know, the way that I see Dallas and the studio members painting at the time? What if I just, I gave it a shot? And I did. And it was hard and it didn't come out right several times. And But eventually it just became like a whole new, you know, I got to that plateau and I was like, sweet, this is great. What do I go next? What do I want to learn? Do I want to learn anything? Do I just want to have fun? There's something extremely satisfying about just sitting down, doing a base coat, doing a wash, doing a dry brush, and be like, I'm done. Look how fast I am. It's like, yeah, you're super fast. That's great. The accomplishment and the joy sometimes just comes from getting something complete. It doesn't matter what the final product looks like. It's just the fact that you did it. So... You should always keep that in mind as you work on this stuff. And this all ties back to the original question. Tell me more about the rival of Spider-Man Doc Ock thing. Well, there you go. It was all that stuff and more to us in terms of like what it meant and what we were trying to do and what we hope to accomplish. And now it's going to come out and, you know, hopefully people love it for what it is. And it looks like... We're going to have the opportunity, based on the current response, to do a lot more of them, and I can't wait. I think it's a great little addition to all of the other amazing products and characters and, you know, normal packs that we get to make for this game. What's going on here? A list of paints attached at some point. That is a great BK question. Um, we've talked a little bit about that kind of stuff. I think there's some challenges with it. Um, when it comes to like Crisis Protocol, obviously doesn't have its own paint line. Um, so the streams are kind of our way to provide some advice and feedback and you know, again, we don't want necessarily anyone to feel like, we talk about this all the time, um, every, there's no one paint to rule them all, there's no one tool, just like there's no one tool to build it all, so having, um, having options and different techniques and, you know, paints in your toolbox be able to do different things is great okay i think i think i'm pretty happy with this honestly um he's looking really good he's got that nice black glossy sheen with the metallic underneath the golds are really popping and they have that nice deep dirty contrast to the smooth shiny blacks so i think we're just going to dive in and start doing some glow all right So, first thing I'm going to start with is I'm just going to start with an off-white. This is White Sands from Scale. And I just want to thin it out a little bit. And then we're just going to run it in wherever we want that glow to be. Kind of build that up. And then we'll see if we can do this on camera from this weird angle. Brush if we need it. That's right, we're looking for directions. I'm getting really quiet. Okay, 
So I got that. Come in. <laughs> yeah, the Carnage miniature. Um, that was another one where I don't remember. I mean, we were looking at a bunch of reference of Carnage and you know, obviously we we're having a lot of discussions about, okay, well, how do we pose him? What do we want to do with him? And everything with Carnage, it's all about those tentacles. And I think we had just come off of, we just come off of working on Doctor Strange, the first Doctor Strange, not the new Doctor Strange, not the Sorcerer Supreme, the first one. And so we'd learned a lot of lessons Marco had about, you know, what you can do in hard plastic and tolerance and how things get held up and all this stuff. And we're like, well, what if we, what if we put them on the tentacles? How would that look? How would you make him, how would you make that work? And from there, it was like, I think Dallas drew a couple of things, and there was no question after that. It was, okay, we have to make this work now, because that's carnage. He was on he was on the big tendrils, and they were dug into the ground, and he's just, like, going symbiote crazy. And a lot of the times, that's how it works. We, we talk very briefly about what we want... And what the character's iconic look is. And then, you know, to Marco's sometimes sadness, although I think he and his team, along with everyone else, really likes the challenge. Um, Dallas sketches something out in a pose, or nowadays Josh or Preston or two art directors sketch out something in a pose. And we don't even worry necessarily about can we do it. It's just what does it look like? And then you see it and you're like, well, we have to do that now. And you kind of get locked in from the start. And that's kind of how you push yourself, right? You you see something, you say, okay, well, now I kind of have to do this because it's so awesome looking. And there's the challenge. Can you meet it? What do you do? <laughs> Carnage, yeah, Carnage is definitely pretty crazy. Um, you know, the swappable hands, like having him be able to use the the claws or the axe or the spike, you know. Carnage is so, trans, he's so, so much about that transmutation, that morphing of his, his symbiote physiology to make weapons that it was another thing where we wanted to make sure that the sculpt allowed for that to happen and people could use you know the iconic carnage weaponry that they like the most whether that's the classic axe or if it was the claws i'm a claw guy myself i really like the i'm a big huge fan of carnage with the claws because to me the axe never stuck around you know he'd, he'd turn his hand into the axe but then pretty closely after that after he delivered the the axe blow his hand would always go back to like the the claws. So to me, most of the motion of the panel is typically with the claws. And that's just what I think of and what I like when it comes to my carnage. I never built one with the axe, actually. It's funny, I think I built like three of them. And I was like, oh yeah, the axe hand's there, that's cool. I'm not going to use it. <laughs> but I think that's another enjoyable part about having options, so... Yeah, I was saying it was hard to ask the question. Oh, who do I team my Hulkbuster up with? Hmm, that's a really great question. Um, uh, who do I like? I'm a big, I'm a big Hawkeye fan. Um, you know, laying on those special conditions to help decrease the effectiveness of a Hulk or a She-Hulk before the Hulkbuster gets in there and mixes it up is pretty darn good. So I'm definitely all in on that. That strategy, that approach. The Hulkbuster is an impressive piece of machinery built by one Tony Stark. So he's kind of you kind of look for force multipliers with him, I think. At least that's what I do. You know? If he's got to do all of the work... Or most of the work. Who do you take to support him so that he can do his work most efficiently? I think he gets along pretty well with Hawkeye. Of course, you can take Thor if you just really want to have that one-two punch.
I mean, you could glue, oh, swappable. You could glue all four on him. An official, oh yeah, Captain Carter from the What If. This goes back to, there's so many cool characters from Marvel. Um, getting to all of them is going to take a little bit. Oh, do I want, I think I will. Technically, I don't think this is supposed to be a node, but on the Marvel Now suit, which we're taking our inspiration from, he does have glowing nodes on his thigh. They kind of run down the whole side of his body. Well, we don't have that. We do have this little node here. Um, so I'm kind of going for kind of that terminator glow the more menacing like red bionic eyeball not necessarily the really bright saturated red so i'm using white which is going to cause the colors to be a bit more pink um if you wanted to get a more like bright red glow using a yellow or an orange here probably an orange would be best But I'm kind of looking for something similar to what I did on my... Oh, can I reach it? I can, but I'm going to have to get in front of the camera. <sighs> so I'm kind of looking for a glow similar to what I did on my war machine here. Where it's a bit more menacing because it's got that white core center. <laughs> uh i don't i don't know that i would call hulkbuster despite the name chat i don't know that i would call hulkbuster an arch nemesis of the hulk so maybe dash those hopes a little early okay um i'm gonna grab some crimson ink tents right here so i'm just gonna grab some crimson ink tents I think it was, I mean, costume changes are always pretty cool. I think Tony Stark and Iron Man in general always had a little bit of a leg up on the competition because it was kind of built into his character. It always felt weird when, you know, Peter or Parker would change his iconic Spider-Man duds. But it never felt as weird when Tony Stark did it. Even if you, even if you change to something where you're like, I don't know if I really love this, this new look, it's still kind of like it just worked um with everything i always thought it felt less weird i was more i was more forgiving about it for whatever reason it's kind of like you know him his garage of cars what car do i want to drive today i don't know i'm gonna drive this one i'm gonna drive that one If Loki is the god of mischief, Tony Stark is just a mischievous tinkerer. He just can't help himself. And he's got to sit there and work in his little workshop and stuff. <laughs> a six by three playmat. Woo! I mean, I don't think there's anything stopping you from necessarily doing that. Um, you just have to homebrew some scenarios for it, but doing some kind of like mega epic battle. If you do that, send some pictures. I'd like to see what it looks like. That would be um, controlling 30 thread of characters. Seems like it'd be pretty cognitively intense, though. Maybe a bit more than what we're kind of looking for from that core experience. But as we talked about, and we'll probably talk about in some mini extravaganza panels, how 
having those alternate game modes is absolutely one of those things that is core to the whole MCP design philosophy and what we want to do with the studio. So. Best conversion you've seen for Crisis Protocol if someone's come out outside of Ooh, there was a Ghost Rider that I saw that somebody did, and I think I've seen a couple of versions of the same thing now, but um, where he was doing kind of like the Akira skid out. So he had just, like the mini looked like he had just kind of like um, drifted into a parking spot on his bike, and there was a big flame trails. And Johnny Blaze had one leg down, and he was kind of standing there looking all, like, holding the bike up like he was about to dismount, and it was amazing. Uh, the conversion was really cool, and I thought very well executed. Um, but on top of that, uh, my cyan? Uh, the paint job that went along with it was just incredible. The, the flames and everything was super cool. Um, it looked great. I've seen some really amazing, ambitious, um, some really ambitious conversions where, you know, players have kind of done their own what-if versions of characters, which I always think is really impressive, you know, taking kit bashing, uh, for example, somebody mentioned Captain Carter. I'm pretty sure I've seen a kit bashed Captain Carter for Corset Iron Man. Or Iron Man, Captain America. Got Iron Man on the brain right now. Um, that utilized a number of different MCP characters to kind of build out this really cool thing. So all of those have been really impressive. I love, you know, I love when people come in and they start messing with things and making them truly their own. That's that's part of the whole hobby and experience. Our goal is to offer something that is like really cool and dynamic and fun, but you know also to hopefully inspire people to go, oh, that's really cool. But what if, what if Black Cat wasn't flipping over a girder? What if she was flipping over a martini sign? Heck yeah, do it. That's amazing. You know, we're the we're the spark. The miniature itself. The studio miniature is just the spark, you know, it just ignites the fire and the excitement and the passion. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be the only way. It shouldn't be the only way, you know, express, express yourself and your characters in the way that you feel is best for them in a manner that makes you excited and happy. That's, that's the most important piece. Cool. All right. Well, you can see how we have that really angry, evil kind of red glow going on it contrasts really nicely with the black and the golds so i think what we can do is let that dry a little bit of time left so we will uh, <gasps> how dare you get rid of the hands from blade chat that's that's just rude <laughs> no i i think there's i mean the blade miniatures has so much great dynamism to him i'm excited to see what people do with him next you know from spider-man on lamppost to black cats doing flips over all kinds of things i think blade we're going to see a lot of really cool stuff on as well okay so i'm going to try something a little different Rather than do this cloud as like a big explosion with a lot of fire, I'm going to see if we can't kind of just do... Mm, you want to try this? I was thinking, originally I was thinking about trying to do like a little blue glowy cloud like from the Repulsor Blast, but now that we have all the glowy nodes red, it kind of feels like maybe we need to... I think maybe we just need to go with the classic... The classic fire! So... We'll grab some yellow ink tents. Oop. Blade is a blast to play. Uh, 
he he definitely to me and of course biased but he plays exactly like i feel like a vampire uh, in crisis protocol should play you know he's like in your face he's very aggressive he's always throwing out that bleed condition which was one of my favorite parts of the design was just like what does he do well he definitely makes you bleed it doesn't matter what he's doing he's he wants you to bleed he's a vampire so of course that's going to be like his mo um but yeah i was he was really fun to kind of come up with and the midnight suns in general are just one of those fun offshoots that you know similar to certain affiliations uh, that are not like the avengers the cabal there's not a not a huge a super deep roster for them so when it comes to those like black order style you kind of know all the characters that will ever really be in it um and there's not really a whole lot of expectation that the team is going to suddenly balloon in membership you do get some leeway to make uh crazier choices you know siege of darkness is a ridiculously powerful team tactic card but you know it was able to be balanced and controlled within the aspect of okay well we know really we know that these characters you know there's a limited subset of characters these are who they are this is what we kind of can expect going forward so we're all we're all fairly square we're good we're in a good spot um Whereas with, you know, affiliations like the Avengers, where the roster is super deep, you have to think a lot more about what kind of effects are you giving those tactic cards and the leaderships and stuff like that. To some extent, all the leaderships are also interesting because they get applied over the entire squad as long as, you know, you meet the base affiliation rules and requirements of 51%. Um, so it is, it is unique to like have to think about and balance those things and a lot of that stuff comes into it you know why is x y or z okay in one place and not in the other well there's always these different aspects that you have to look at and think about oh the, the three box challenge, I have seen a little bit about that. I'll be honest, I haven't read much about it, but it sounded pretty neat from what I saw. Uh, it's the core box, then you have to pick three three expansions. Am I right on that? Is that how that works? I just grabbed some red ink mix it in with the yellow to make a little bit of orange and now i'm just going to kind of like blend these two inks together and they're going to get really smooshy and gross and probably off camera because this is going to dry in time then what i'll do is i'll go back through and i'll stipple on my smoke color uh, which depending on how gross gross and grody you want it you can either use um, like an off-white like that white sands color would work pretty well you can use a more colder blue color if you want a bit more smoke you can use a darker black if you want it to be really oily and very explosiony if you want it to just be really bright and crazy you could kind of just leave it this way i suppose um, wouldn't be my first choice but you could so I guess what I would say, if it's a core box and three packs, um, well, that's good. I'd have to think about that. Just initially, like off the cuff, I'm always going to go with what I think is most fun or what's going to be awesome to paint uh, in addition to like what characters I want to play. So I would probably go... Ooh. I think I would probably just go full on, maybe full on Avengers. 
and do Sam Wilson War Machine, probably Hulk, and then Agent Winnow and Hawkeye. That's my that's my hot take right now in thinking about it. And just go like as full into Avengers as as hard into Avengers as I could. Probably not really worry too much about mixing affiliations or anything with that limited of a that limit of a set. But I think you could do some pretty good stuff between Sam Wilson, War Machine, Hulk. I know everyone's all about, you know, the Sam, the quote-unquote Sam spam. I've seen a lot of chatter about that. And that is a really strong, like, Sam loves to play wide, but I think it'd be really interesting to play a bit wide, but also throw in a Hulk. Just to be like, okay, well, I got a lot of bodies, but I also have a Hulk. What do you want to do about that? Because, you know, I'm only looking at core box crisis cards with maybe a gamma gamma shelter from Hulk, but I don't think I'd throw that in. So. Uh, cool. All right, well, I think that's pretty good. we got three minutes left, so I'm just going to let that dry, and then we'll come back through. Like I said, I would just stipple on the cloud cover over the top of it. Well, that'll give us a really nice base um, of color so that as you stipple or dry brush, you'll still have that nice hot, warm, orange yellow like underblast to it. Uh, and you can just kind of control that for as much as you want. Kind of give you an example of two different techniques just to show you what it would look like finished. Like here is a cable where you can see how we have the orange and the yellow underneath, but then we did a white kind of smoke cloud, dirt cloud on top. And then here's a domino where exact same technique, except we used a black and a gray and a little bit more red to make it look like an angry explosion. So this looks really violent and like oily and smoky um, as opposed to this more softer kind of like dirt getting kicked up by, a, by an explosion. And there's everything in between. So, you know, you can really, like, you can really play with all that stuff. Um, here's my black cat flipping over an explosion that people might now recognize uh, as coming from one new Spider-Man. But this one, I didn't do any of the smoke. I just did the colors over the top of it. So it doesn't really have any of the, like, colors over top. It's just reds and oranges and yellows all mixed together. So there's tons of opportunity and options, but outside of finishing that, I think we managed to get this Hulkbuster done uh, in about two sessions. A little bit of time extra for glazing and stuff. Really happy with how this guy turned out. I think he looks great. Definitely an awesome homage to the... Oh, I missed those. I'll have to get those in the back. I totally missed those little, those little glow event nodes. Um, totally awesome homage to the Marvel Now still suit kind of colors of Iron Man. Definitely a different take on the Hulkbuster. Much more aggressive and angry. So we'll just have to paint his little, his little form next and we'll be ready to go. So with that said, um, I'm going to get this camera off of me and pop it over to here. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining me, everyone. I hope uh, you had fun. It's always great and a blast to get to hang out with y'all. Uh, over the course of the hour and just do some hobbying and talk shop uh, and try to answer as many questions as I can. Of course, if you have more questions, you can tune back in uh, next week for Mini Stravaganza where we're going to be doing all kinds of things. I saw a lot of questions on there that I ignored because we're going to be covering those in some panels next week and I don't want to give it all away because I'd get in trouble. And then what we do for Mini Stravaganza, we just have to paint more. So maybe that's a good thing. Um, otherwise, be sure to watch out for that schedule. It's going to get posted on our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Probably in the next day or two, I would imagine. Uh, and then, of course, come back tomorrow, 1 p.m. Pacific, for Dallas Kemp. He's going to be doing some work uh, on 
um, some more hobby stuff, and then we'll be back Thursday at 1 p.m. Pacific for one more stream of hobby. We'll be off on Friday. Uh, we're going to take Friday off to celebrate Shang-Chi coming out as well as get ready for some mini extravaganza stuff because next week's going to be crazy. Again, starting September 9th, 9 a.m. Pacific. That will be when everything kicks off with opening ceremonies. Schedule will tell you everything else that's coming. If you want to find out about Hulkbuster, I'll give you a little preview. It's going to be right after opening ceremonies on Thursday uh, at, I think, 10 a.m. Pacific. So... If you want to find out more about Hulkbuster and what he does in the game, how he got developed, be sure to tune in for that. And then there's a whole bunch more content coming your way. Till next time, everyone, be good to each other, stay safe, stay healthy, and we will see you on the next one. Goodbye.